the conference is really as good as the people who participate, so y'all, y'all, y'all keep coming, because without you, this conference doesn't exist. We could lecture to ourselves, but it'd be much less interesting to lecture to a blank wall. So come every year, bring your friends. Maybe we can make 150 next year. Not that numbers are the be-all and end-all, but uh, sometimes nice to have a crowd. So this paper is uh, less technical in some ways than, than some of the things we've had, rather general. I think when we write papers for the conference, these are things that we've been working on, things that help us in our own study. This is what makes the Bible intelligible to me. There's some remarks on why are we different? What is the history behind this extraordinary phenomenon that we are saying one thing and everybody else seems to be saying something else? How is it we in England, Barbara uh, and myself, were kicked out of every Bible study known to man? We even had a communion service in our house and dear, dear friends of ours walked in the room and when they discovered that we were not Trinitarians, they walked out in the middle of the service. That was quite hurtful. And then we said, well, God, is there anybody else on earth that can count up to one and say God is one, not two or three? We found the Christadelphians who graciously came in the house and said to us, the doctrine of Jesus is wrong. Jesus did not pre-exist his birth. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Haven't you read about the rock that followed them? That was Christ, wasn't it? Come on, what's wrong with that? Ah, he said, that is a spiritual, typical reference there. Ah, guy doesn't believe in the Bible, does he? I said, I was so ignorant, I was so uninformed, so unsophisticated, that it took two years at least to get my mind around the idea that you cannot be pre-human and human. That Jesus is not human. You cannot be pre-human and human. You are by definition not a member of the human race if you don't begin in the womb of your mother Mary. Or in, not your mother Mary, but in his case, his mother Mary. Right, it's late in the day, you know, brain functions a little bit more slowly sometimes. <laughs> so anyway, these, these are some reflections which I think will be useful in your Bible study. I'm a C of E boy, Church of England boy, reeling from the effects of the Bible 50 years later, was taken to a Get Saved meeting at Oxford in 1957, 56 I think, and was asked to get saved. Put up my hand, went forward to get saved, went back to my room, opened a Bible, and I said, what have I done? What is this? What does this mean? And I began reading the Bible, and I saw the kingdom of God. I saw the nations beating their swords into plowshares, and my dad was working with the World Council of Churches as a retired admiral in the Navy, and his efforts were to solve the Middle East problem and to get the Arabs and the Jews together. And he killed himself, not literally, wore himself out trying to achieve peace on earth. And I had this vision from Isaiah. It wasn't my vision. I saw Yeshayahu, this vision of nations actually destroying their tanks. So that if you decide to have a gun or a tank to kill another human being, some being will swoop down on you and say, don't do that. Why kill another human person? And that vision is still a beautiful one for me. Quite apart from the fact that the world is in chaos. You go to Malawi, where they have grits three times a day and no plumbing and no light. Not much of a life. They die in their 40s from malnutrition. What kind of a world is that? So uh, I think I see this vision of the kingdom as I get older more clearly. And I actually really believe it now. For a while it was hard for me to connect, as they say in America, head and heart. I could understand it. I now see the enormous need we have for a real world of peace where Satan is banished, where the lies are done away with, and people are actually living at peace with each other. So these are some reflections on things that have been coming by us recently as we prepare for these conferences. First reminder of the one with whom we have chosen to be associated, top of my paper here, I'll read some of this and ad lib as well. Jesus Christ, wanted for sedition, criminal anarchy, vagrancy, and conspiring to overthrow the established government. That's who you're associated with. Poorly dressed. I perhaps should modify that to normally dressed. I don't think richly dressed, though. Uh, quality and all that, not necessarily. I think probably average dress, maybe not poorly. Said to be a carpenter by trade, has visionary ideas, associates with common working people, the unemployed, the bums, alien, believed to be a Jew, alias, prince of peace, son of man, light of the world, professional agitator, red beard, marks on hands and feet, the results of injuries inflicted by an angry mob led by respectable citizens, churchgoers and authorities. That's you. That's the Jesus you associate with. And you always read yourself into the text of the Bible. If that's what Jesus was, then are you? Are we like him? 
or we just respect, uh, respectable and harmless and innocuous. This I, this, I think, is the portrait of the Jesus we follow. Secondly, what is the point of our attempts at solid, illuminating Bible study? We do a lot of that, explaining the Bible. Why are we doing this? The words of Scripture are living words with permanent value. As transmitting life now and life forever, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. That's a striking statement. Wisdom offered to pour out my spirit, wisdom said here in Proverbs 123, pour out my spirit on us, which in that passage is equivalent to making my words known to you. So presumably then if you make the words of Jesus in the Bible clear, you are imparting spirit. That would appear to be the case. I like those verses. These are not just dead words printed in a Bible. They are living, uh, tra transmitting life words. They're life transmitting words. Then test the spirits by testing the words, John said, didn't he? Listen to what somebody's saying. Do they sound like Jesus? If somebody comes to you and says, we're going to polish rainbows in heaven and prepare heavenly dishes and tend heavenly gardens, I have to say, you don't sound like Jesus. I didn't get that from reading the Gospels, but that's what your leading evangelist says in 26 languages across the world. So testing the words is testing the mind, is testing the spirit, isn't it? We all do this all the time, don't we? We assess our children's mood by the words that come out of their mouth. We do it all the time. So we assess theology then by hearing what people have to say. What about these marvelous verses? The Spirit of the Lord spoke through the mouth of David, and thus God's words were on David's lips. That's David's famous statement. He says, the Spirit of Yahweh spoke by me, his words were on my tongue. It's clear enough, isn't it? The mind is driving the words, obviously. What was true of the sweet singer of Israel should be true of us. Confusion over the words of Scripture leads to a reduction and blockage of spirit. So it would seem then that getting the doctrines right would encourage the spirit. Some people say our church is, is not as lively as it should be. You might want to look at the doctrines. You might want to look at the doctrines. You say, as Greg said, Oh God, undeceive me if I'm deceived. And this can happen to all of us. Every pastor, I think, should sit down from time and say, what is it in my package that is simply not biblical? Because it can happen to all of us. I might do better if I preach the words of Jesus faithfully in every respect. Okay, so now then, pop, soda, and coke. I've learned that various people sharing a common American heritage and language nevertheless confuse us when they speak of their favorite drink. Just imagine how bewildering all this can be for the foreigner not trained in the ins and outs of the language usage. I believe the public is equally flummoxed when trying to read the Bible. I remember, of course, as a child of 13 in a boarding school, making every year a firm resolution, I did, year after year, to read the New Testament, but I failed about chapter 2 of Matthew. I remember that so well. I'm, I'm going to read that Bible, but I absolutely got bogged down. I couldn't manage beyond Matthew 2. I got terribly bored and turned to something like schoolboy exciting dramas, you know, something I could make heads or tails of. I could not pronounce those names, and I was terribly bored by the genealogical tables. That's as far as I got. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I didn't know the language. Oh, I knew English all right, but I had no idea about the meaning of the key terms, like Son of God, Kingdom of God, or even God. I didn't know what those words meant. I don't think my colleagues in England do. So no wonder they don't read the Bible. When I later asked the clergy about Matthew 5, 5, which really pounds in my heart, blessed are the meek because they're going to inherit the earth. What does that mean, I said to the clergyman with his pipe and he, uh, a cocktail party. Yes, we used to go to cocktail parties. We weren't drunk out of our minds. We were sipping a little uh, sherry or something like that and carrying on polite conversation. I said, what does this mean? Blessed are the meek, they're going to inherit the earth. And he'd take an extra couple of puffs on his pipe and look down at me. I was a, 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 always a, a very small compared with these massive, impressive clergymen, and he would say, that's a good question, lad. I'll have to think about that. I thought, that speaks to me loud, that text. What's so difficult? Why do we need an army of theologians? What part of the word earth don't you understand? I'll have to think about it. When I also asked if he preached on the second coming, you know, this is when I got a little information from my original ignorance, he said that was the one sermon, these are true stories, 
these were defining moments in our theological history. The one sermon he really hated doing on the second coming. So he was supposed to tackle that subject at least once a year on Advent Sunday. You know, the prayer book said, this Sunday you preach on the second coming. The guy said, I have no idea what that's about. I mean, come on, I don't, I don't want to preach on that. I don't understand it. And then we also later went back to my hometown. We said, when, what about the Trinity? Do you preach on that? He said, I'm supposed to preach on the Trinity once a year. That's the sermon I absolutely detest. So that gave me the opportunity to say, well, I happen to have written a book on that subject. You take this. And that's probably about as far as we got with that one. So the confused situation today, I mean, isn't this a challenge for all of us? 30,000 denominations. It's akin to the story of the king in the Old Testament who took his scissors and cut up the text of Scripture and threw it in the fire. And I give you the reference in the footnote, right? That's what he did. People are cutting up the text, failing to put the pieces of the puzzle together to make a harmonious, intelligible whole, and suffering the inevitable consequences of non-comprehension. You hear this so often, don't you? I cannot understand the Bible. It's very confusing. I'm trying very hard, but I just don't understand it. So this then might explain why 2% of 7 million Londoners are attending church regularly. You know the old quip, they only go to be hatched, matched, and dispatched. I've used that often because it gets a smile out of people in the evening when they're feeling a little tired, but I like that. They literally go to be baptized, married, and the end of their life. How can they not find, how can they not find the Bible a captivatingly interesting book? How can they not? I think they need help in understanding, and that's where you come in. Show them what it means. Jesus was insistent on a good understanding. Uh, we who teach, you know, we're very heavy on this area, because that's what teachers do, they, they, they try to impart understanding. But wasn't he insistent on a good understanding? Matthew 13, 51, he said, do you understand these things after the fact? Do you see this? Do you get it? He asked the students. Have you understood it? John says Jesus came to give us this text is not a refrigerator verse. It should be. Why isn't this pinned on the refrigerator? Jesus came, amongst other things, to give us an understanding in order to know God. That Greek word, theania, it's about the most intellectual word you can get. It means the power to reason properly, to think for goodness sake. That's what Jesus came to do, to give us that. Why isn't that text popular? Everyone knows John 3.16. What happened to this one? An understanding. That's very clear. So then, even stronger, Isaiah 53, 11, and the commentaries battle with this. They don't like this one at all. It doesn't seem to, to be the sort of thing the prophet should have said. But the Messiah there is said to come to make us righteous by his knowledge, not just by his death and resurrection, important though that is. By his knowledge. Jesus was a preacher and a rabbi and a conveyor of knowledge. Not understanding the words of Jesus and the New Testament is something apparently to be avoided on pain of death. Jesus makes the reception of his creative saving words the absolute hallmark of successful Christianity. At the climax of his ministry, I like this in John 12, Jesus shouts. Did you know that he shouted occasionally? I'm making the mistake of yelling. You know, it's very bad. You should just keep very calm and quiet. And some people say preaching is yelling and teaching is just talking normally. <laughs> There's some truth in that. Jesus did shout on occasion, but I don't think he raised his voice all the time, any more than teachers normally should. He did shout there in John 12. He does this rarely, but he also used to shout or cry out, presumably to give explanation, uh, sorry, when he gave his explanation of the sower parable. Luke 8.8 8 says, he customarily raised his voice when he got to the thing about the seed. That fascinates me. Not just once, but he usually and customarily raised his voice at a certain point in that presentation. Jesus shouts in John 12, 44, for good reason. Our immortality depends on our listening to the words of Yeshua. And by the way, that's Yeshua than E, not Yashua. There's a messianic tendency to call this Yashua. There's no such word as Yashua. The word is ye either Yeshua or Yehoshua in Hebrew, not Yashua. That's, I think, trying to get Yah into Jesus, right? Probably. So anyway, Yeshua, if you want to call him by his Hebrew name, who is the ultimate prophet, he said this, the person who believes in me believes in the one who commissioned me, that is, appointed me as his agent. I came as a light. Now, if someone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I don't judge him. I didn't come to judge, but to save. The person who refuses 
rejects and will not receive my words has one who judges him. The very word I spoke will judge him on the last day. It's amazing stuff, isn't it? Supposing some of the material we've been going through this week challenges us at some point. Are we going to obey or not? I mean, these are scary issues. Are we hearing the words of Jesus? Are we doing them? Are we obeying them? If we were the devil, we would work hard at making the words of Jesus incomprehensible. We would still, however, safely ask people to accept Jesus. That would sound very reassuring, wouldn't we? Have you ever thought what it would be like to be the devil? <laughs> How would you deceive people? You wouldn't stop saying Jesus. You'd go on saying Jesus till you're blue in the face. But you would cleverly not tell them what Jesus actually said. Accepting Jesus is here precisely defined as equivalent to accepting the words of Jesus. Peter speaks about, I like this text, I just discovered this the other day, 1 Peter 1, 2, obedience to Jesus and sprinkling of the blood. That's neat. Not just the death for his sins, but also obedience to Jesus. And the words of Jesus are summarized, of course, under the umbrella term, Evangelion tis Vasilias, Gospel of the Kingdom, a phrase you don't hear on radio and television. That's the summary statement. Why then is the public constantly asked to, quote, accept Jesus, but never to accept the kingdom gospel word and words of Jesus? Why? I don't understand that. This, I think, was the genius of the Abrahamic faith, to put their finger on that problem. Failure to perceive the equivalency principle, accept, believe in Jesus, equals accept the words of Jesus, causes them a lot of grief. Pursuing the equivalency principle further, here we go. Does John use the word faith? That's the Greek word pistis. Actually, no. Not really. Once only in the epistles. Then John did not have anything to say about faith. If you take that Evans woodenly, he did not. He said almost nothing about faith. But this conclusion would be absurd, wouldn't it? John, in fact, uses the more dynamic word to believe. So he certainly talks about faith, but he uses the verb. So he did have lots to say about belief or faith. Now, did John use the word gospel, ask your friend? Not once. So he was not interested in the gospel, right? No. <laughs> he must have been not interested in the gospel. Nonsense. He prefers the very strong and legally tinged word testimony and testify. He did not use the verb to proclaim or to evangelize. John didn't. But he certainly believed in both concepts passionately. He just used other vocabulary to cover the same concepts. Now we're on to that pop, soda, coke thing, right? See how that works. Same drink, different names, but you've got to be inside that understanding to, to appreciate it. Okay, so he just used other vocabulary to cover the same concept. He engaged in equations or equivalences. The testimony or gospel of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, it says in Revelation 19.10. So, if you're preaching the kingdom gospel, you are uttering words which are prophetic. You're exercising the spirit of prophecy, provided you're giving the testimony of Jesus. Would that be right? That's a marvelous verse, 1910 of Revelation. So, the gospel of the kingdom is the spirit of prophecy. I would think so, because we're talking about what's going to happen to the world before and after the second coming. That's amazing. This is a prophetic utterance that comes in terms of the gospel of the kingdom. Paul uttered his famous last words to Timothy by solemnly testifying, this is an interesting verse, to both the coming and the kingdom preach the word, he said. The very last thing he said, for goodness sake, Timothy, get this, I'm going to give you a solemn testimony as to the coming and the kingdom. Preach the word, the last thing he ever said. Are we reading ourselves into the text? Are we the young Timothys? Are we doing this? I mean, this would be the challenge to me to read ourselves into the text here. Not to see these equivalences is consciously or unconsciously to compartmentalize and fragment the New Testament and fail to see its great unifying message is to read the Bible in a fog. Did Jesus believe in justification? Hmm. Did he teach this as a basis for right relationship with God? Everyone knows that Paul did. His rather heavy, as it now sounds to us, or after all the contorted arguments about justification, all the struggle over justification, uh, that language is very heavy now. It's become the standard for many when talking about salvation. But did Jesus use the word justify, verb or noun? Certainly not the noun, justification. He didn't use that. Very rarely the verb. 
He spoke of the man who, unlike the pious Pharisee, pleaded with God for mercy as justified, right? He went down justified, as to say, right with God rather than wrong with God, straight rather than crooked. Jesus did say that we're to be justified by what we say or fail to say. That he did say. For by your words, this is striking, by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. And presumably a large part of that would be the word of the gospel that you preach. Better get that one right in order to be justified. That's in Matthew 12, 37. But the word justify is very rare in the recorded sayings of Jesus. So did Jesus not believe in justification? Being right with God rather than wrong, straight before God rather than crooked before God. Of course he did. Jesus was deeply interested in our being right before God. He came to save the lost. Jesus spoke about us being forgiven. And he meant the same thing. I would argue, no different. Did Paul use the word forgiveness in his letters often? No, not really. Twice in the late epistles, not in Romans at all, not once in Romans, in Paul's own words. Paul used the verb forgave only once in Colossians 3.3. Paul prefers the word justify, to put right, to pronounce pardoned, telling us that we are no longer on spiritual death row. Romans 4 demonstrates this principle of equivalency beautifully, and most important, unifies Paul with Jesus. In Romans, Paul is making his point about justification. The Greek noun is related to the verb to be right or righteous, right with God rather than wrong with God. Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed God and it was counted in his favor as making him right. I love that. God spoke, Abraham was willing to say, yes, it's right. I believe it. Isn't this the way we trust each other? Is this complex? No, easy. In the Garden of Eden, they listened to the devil. They said, I think the devil's telling us the truth. So when Abraham believes God, this is the model of faith, one of those refrigerator verses that's standard and fundamental. He actually believed what God said. And God said, that's my man. Here's somebody who actually believes what God said. When somebody says that God is one, somebody's nodding. Others are saying, I'm not sure about one. That could be compound one. That could be three or more. That must be a bit frustrating for God, you think, since he calls himself one about 20,000 times and says that he's by himself, all alone, nobody with him, I'm alone, I'm one, over and over again. And people say, no, nah, I don't think that's right. My church doesn't teach that, so I'll go with something different. Now, Romans 4 then demonstrates this principle, as we said here. I was quoting in Romans 4, 3, three lines down there. Abraham believed God. It was counted in his favor. Marvelous verse. In the same breath, Paul goes on, pulling on another proof text from the Old Testament, this, from, this time from the Psalms. He says this, How delightful it is for the man, how blessed is he whose lawlessness has been forgiven. Justified, that is. No difference. So justification is to be forgiven, to be pardoned, in order to be right with God, I, I suppose. No difference between being forgiven and being justified. Paul quotes two proof texts relating to Old Testament heroes to make his point about justification. It means to be forgiven like David. That's nice. It needs to be forgiven as David was, pardoned. When we believe like Abraham. That's right. We believe like Abraham, we're forgiven like David. And if we were in any doubt, Luke reports Paul's famous sermon in Antioch where he said, I want you to know that through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. I think Luke used the easier word there, see, when he's reporting Paul. But Paul would have talked about justification, no doubt. Paul was a scholar, and not to be taken first. You know that. Paul is a, a scholar. And so he's not for the general public just to get into first, necessarily. Jesus' language is easier. So you start with Jesus and then work with Paul later, perhaps. In Acts, Luke simplifies Paul for us, reporting his teaching in more popular and less, quote, scholarly language. Talking about using two equivalent proof texts to teach one's point, note Hebrews 1.5. Well, we have a brilliant bringing together of 2 Samuel 7.14 and Psalm 2.7. Well, it says, I will be the Messiah's father, and today I have begotten you. Both of these point to the all-important origin of the Son of God. And that's anathema to that other system, because the Son of God there has no origin in time, according to their system. Those two verses are beautiful. I will be his father, future tense. I'm not his father already. I'm going to be his father is equivalent to, to this day I have begotten him, which means to bring him into existence. 
Now, did John use the word repent or repentance? Not once in all his writings. But of course, John very much believed in our repenting. He included it, no doubt, in the idea of believing after forsaking sin, which he described as failure to believe in Jesus. Yes, sin means not believing in or believing Jesus. John 16, 9 defines it. There Jesus said sin amounts to failure to believe the Son or believe in the Son. And not much, not very keen on believing on because nobody believes on anything these days. It has that foggy King James ring that I, I, for myself is awkward. You believe in Jesus or you believe Jesus. So then, uh, that would appear to be exactly the same idea. Believing in Jesus, or believing Jesus, which I think are equivalent, means believing in the words of Jesus. No words of Jesus, no Jesus. We are what we think and say. If you won't believe in Moses, Jesus said, and his writings, how in the world can you believe my words? I like that. If you're not prepared to believe what Moses said, how can you believe what I say? That's very clear. He who hears my word believes the one who sent me. I like that. By hearing the words of Jesus, you're believing in his sponsor. Very clear. Whoever does not accept the kingdom of God as a child won't enter it. What about that one? If you're not prepared to to accept the kingdom of God message as an open-eyed child, you're not going to be in it because God is looking for simple-minded people who will say, hey, that's a good plan, God. Yeah, I think that sounds right to me. That's good. I believe it. I think it's very difficult. Sometimes I think theologians probably should all retire, you know, just get out of the way and let people read these, these simple verses. So this is equivalent to being born again, by the way, the same thing as we'll get to, by accepting the kingdom gospel. Some tricks now. Watch out for the tricks. The devil is very tricky. He has his methodias, Paul said, his sleight of hand. He's very subtle. The devil's very clever. He knows exactly how sloppy we can be with words and how easy it is to get people off track. What about this? Did Jesus preach the gospel? Evangelicals, I've asked, are not quite sure about that. Mm, Somewhat doubtful. Did he not just die for the gospel, they would say? According to your Greek texts and some good translations, Jesus preached the gospel and Paul preached the gospel. But the NIV, the nearly inspired version, you know that one, The nearly inspired version says, which we need to watch carefully, allows Jesus to preach the good news. If you look at it, Jesus is allowed to preach the good news of the kingdom, but never the gospel of the kingdom. There's no justification for that in the Greek at all. It diverts the mind slightly because people are hearing good news. I know they're equivalent, but it creates an artificial difference between good news and gospel, which isn't there in the text. The NIV very inconsistently allows the word gospel and kingdom to occur together Only in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom. Only there. And that's not Jesus preaching it directly, right? That's the church preaching it, I would say. They destroy the equivalency of good news and gospel. Which is the same word, right? Good news, gospel is evangelion with a modern Greek pronunciation. By giving the impression that these are slightly different. This is about as bad as saying that the kingdom of heaven is not the equivalent of the kingdom of God, right? At Dallas Theological Seminary, They were taught that the kingdom of heaven is different from the kingdom of God. Look at Chuck Swindoll's quote there, footnote 5 at the bottom. Chuck Swindoll seems uncertain about this. He seems to refer to the same thing. What do you mean, Dr. Swindoll? Seems to refer to the same thing? Come on now, you're making this chaotic for me. You see how bad that is? It's not fair on the public to tell them the kingdom of heaven is different from the kingdom of God. They're equivalents. Then in the second paragraph, here's another equivalence. Repenting, believing the gospel of the kingdom, and being forgiven are all one package, the key to conversion and regeneration. But evangelicals have been taught not to see that equivalence. They've been instructed out of Paul, and particularly Romans. They've been told that the gospel is in Romans 10, 9, and 10. Confess Jesus, believe God resurrected, resurrected, resurrected him, but they were not pointed to the equivalent defining concept in verse 17 which says believing Paul said originates in hearing the gospel of Christ you see that oh yeah believe in Jesus he died for you and rose and they put a period 
What about the conclusion of Paul's statement where he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by Messiah's message. We're right back to the gospel of the kingdom. That verse is left out almost always. That seems to be rather unfair. Evangelicals don't seem to know that Paul and Jesus taught the same gospel truths using different language. Evangelicals do not seem to know that Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed is implied by Paul in his words about being born of the Spirit. Born of the promise is the same thing. Missing in their system also is the equivalence between preaching the word and proclaiming Christ. Which is equivalent to preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the name of Jesus. This is the text that got this whole denomination going. And all they did was to say, what is preaching Christ? You just stand there and say, hey, Christ, Christ. Is that preaching Christ? What about the word? You stand there and say, word, word. Obviously not. If you go down to the 12th verse, it tells you what that is. A fuller definition. It means talking about the kingdom at every opportunity, even in the hairdresser or at the bank. It's nice the kingdom is coming. Isn't that great? It's wonderful. The kingdom is coming. It gets people thinking. And I think they did that all the time in the New Testament. John reports Jesus as saying that being born again is the absolute condition of entering. Here's another interesting point to me. John says, you know the text, right? Unless you get born again, you ain't nowhere. That's Georgian side. You aren't going anywhere. You're dead in the water, or whatever the Aussie expression would be, anyway. John reports Jesus saying that being born again is the absolute condition for entering the KG. The synoptics report nothing about Jesus being born again. You ever think of that? Poor old Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They just didn't know much about anything because they forgot to say, by the way, you've got to be born again. Did they? That would seem odd. Or did they say it with something uh, uh, equivalent? So the synoptics report nothing about Jesus being born again. How is this possible? Only on the principle of equivalency. They do speak of regeneration by the power of the seed, stroke, word, gospel of the kingdom. I think they must do that. And so talking to Nicodemus, who was a scholar, you might talk about being born again. But talking to people on the edge of a lake, fishermen and farmers, you might want to use even more basic agricultural terminology, right? The analogy of the seed. Everybody knew about that. So John, then, is to be read after the synoptics, not the other way around. So what does Billy Graham say? Get saved and read the book of John. What about doing Matthew, Mark, and Luke first? Three corroborating accounts of the teaching of Jesus. Could that be important? Why don't we have three books of Esther? Or three books of Genesis? We've got three Kingdom of God documents there, which are absolutely shriek at you. Give a child those books and say, what was Jesus doing? Every child will say, he was a Kingdom of God preacher. Give them John and you're into a deeper thing for the expert or somebody a little bit more trained, perhaps. Okay, so uh, here's how the New Testament salvation program works, I suggest. Three corroborating accounts of Jesus' major theology of salvation are found in the parable of the sower, which, Mark says, is also a parable about parables because Jesus said, if you don't get this one, you don't understand any of them. He said that, clearly. All the three accounts speak of the believers being given the mystery or mysteries of the kingdom. To be given this wonderful revelation, of course, implies the Holy Spirit of illumination. It implies the Holy Spirit. And people will say, there's nothing about the Holy Spirit in synopsis. Let's take me to Acts quickly where I can get the Holy Spirit going. That's not right. What if word implies spirit? Are we really suggesting when Jesus said, to you have been given the illuminating power to understand the kingdom, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit, because we didn't have any of that to lack, you see. Anything to get rid of the synoptics. I would say back to the synoptics in, in the Church of England for about 10 years. Just read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Nothing else. Let's get our feet grounded in the teaching of Messiah in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So I, I think that that must be the way this works, that the illuminating mysteries are not seen without the Holy Spirit. The fact that you understand the kingdom of God is evidence of the Spirit in your life, isn't it? How else is this possible? Why is it my brother thinks I'm a crazy, I'm a yank for the first, my, lang my accent has become so unbearably American to my brother. And I've got to go off to some unknown church in, in, in some unknown state. It's not even Kentucky where Brian's from, you know, some famous place. But it's Georgia, and it's something about Abraham's church, which is meaningless to I say it's all about the kingdom. He doesn't see that yet, although he's, he's getting the picture gradually, I think. 
To be given this wonderful revelation, of course, implies Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Holy Spirit, the power of the word, is sufficient to imply the Spirit. Jesus then described the typically disappointing effects of preaching the gospel. The audience, he said, will tend not to understand it, so you mustn't be discouraged. They will resist the word and the Spirit. Then Jesus said this, this is amazing. If they did understand the word of the kingdom, Matthew 39, then they'd repent. What would happen if they didn't understand the word of the kingdom? Presumably they wouldn't repent and be forgiven. That's a staggeringly interesting text. Mark 4, 11 and 12. You get a text like this. Somebody else said, as Jim Madison, a text pound in your heart, like Acts 1, 6, is this the time to restore the kingdom? For years, that pounded in my mind, day after day. That's a key text. Well, this one got into my bloodstream some years back. I thought, that's amazing. If they understood the kingdom, then they could repent. I thought, well, why would that be? Well, didn't Adam lose the glory of the kingdom? So what's repentance? It's to be restored to the glory of the destiny of the kingdom, which is the standard from which man has fallen, right? If you want to go back to the beginning, get back to the kingdom idea, because failure to believe in the kingdom is sin. It's when you grasp the kingdom destiny of mankind, you're repenting of your failure to do so, presumably. But the public thinks, well, repenting means I give up drinking excessively, or adultery, or swearing, or smoking. That's fine too. Is that all it is? Is it just being a good chap? Do you crucify good chaps? Was Jesus just a benign, uh, kindly, gentle person? He was certainly that. Is that all he was? Is it just ethics? I don't think so. He was threatening the whole world system with his kingdom. Okay, the next paragraph. One of the greatest equivalences in the practical equation of word and spirit, as Barclay says so well, he says, the word is the agent of rebirth, in Jewish thinking, a word was more than a sound expressing a meaning. A word actually did things. I like that. It has action in it, has activity. The word of God is not simply a sound, it's an effective cause. In the creation story, God's word creates. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He sent his word and healed them. God's word will accomplish all that God pleases. God's word not only said things, it did things. I like that from Barclay. It's not just a printed thing on a page. It should be changing us. So God's word also melts ice, did you notice? That's nice. It has creative power. Uh, Friedrich Büchel said, I discovered this just the other day, I like this. The reception of the Spirit without preceding proclamation of the gospel does not occur in Luke. Read that again. A reception of the Spirit without preceding proclamation of the gospel doesn't occur in Luke. Then he says, the connection between word and spirit is inseparable. I think the two go hand in hand. You cannot separate the word from the spirit. But if you're the devil, of course, you're doing that all the time. You're, you're saying, I'll show you spirit and push you over backwards, or come up with some incomprehensible language that nobody can define and require everybody to do it on pain of death. That spirit. Well, no, the word should be there clearly if spirit is to be there. Next paragraph, one of the great. Oh, I did that one. Okay. No wonder then that Paul said in the middle there that the gospel word of the kingdom is the power of God leading to salvation. So I suppose the wrong gospel destroys the power of God in our lives. Would that be right? It limits the power of God in our lives. What is said here can be equally said of the creative activity of God's Spirit. People who look for the Spirit in all sorts of places outside the creative energetic words of God are liable to call for another Spirit if it's not anchored in the Word. I love this great watchword of Jesus. And Steve Ahn caught this one in class and loved this one too. 663 of John, he says, the words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and life. That's worth meditating on. They are transmitters of life and spirit. So if you want more spirit, you might go after the words and see if that would work. I suppose that would work that way. Then the thing in Zechariah 7.12, they made their hearts like flint so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Now, did Jesus use the word grace? Not in the records we have of his sayings. But when he said to you has been given by God, 
a divine passage, to know the mystery of the kingdom, grace is implied, graciously given. So I think it's quite clear that that equivalent is there. It's the equivalent and does not have to be stated. If one is in the know and someone says he drinks soda, everybody ought to know that he drinks pop. But do you? Does the public? I think we have to teach that. Long ago, in his popular English lectures, The Religion of Jesus and the Faith of Paul, uh, Adolf Deisman attempted to mark out the path that scholars should take in dealing with the various theological terms in Paul's letters. So, for example, when speaking of Paul's teaching on justification, Deisman said, along my lines here, according to my conception, justification is not the quintessence of Paulinism. Just don't hammer away on justification, so that's the only thing Paul said, is what he's saying. But it's just one witness it's one way of saying forgiveness, pardon, right? Among others, to describe his experience of salvation. Justification, Dyson said, is one ancient picture word alongside many others. Justification is one note, which along with many others, redemption, adoption, sonship, and so on, is harmonized in the one chord that testifies to salvation. And then he went on to say, and I won't read that next quote, but the impression of complexity in Paul, people get very confused with Paul, it's only an impression of complexity because Paul uses different words to say the same thing. When you sort that out, it becomes a lot easier. At the page there, James Denny said a similar thing. The fact that all who speak to us in the New Testament are familiar with the experience of the Holy Spirit does not always make it easier for, for us to understand them. It's clear that various experience are experiences are described in this way and we cannot refrain from asking whether experiences which one writer recounts without any reference to the spirit would have been explained as pneumatic spirit things by someone else. Very simply this, you're born of the spirit, Peter says you're born of the word. Any difference? I don't think so. Uh, I tried to put that together in that, in that little book about um, aims and claims, but it's clear all the apostles are talking about being born again. You're born of the Spirit, according to Paul and John. You're born of the Word, according to Peter. And you're born again from the Word in James. Are they all saying different things? I don't think so. They're all in the immortality business, offering the public immortality in the kingdom through, be through being born again. So I don't want to read uh, the rest of that page. Go to page six a moment. I want to draw this to a close because it's, it's a lot of stuff. But um, just, just to some, pick out some of this. Uh, contemporary equivalency, leading scholars begin to sound like the Bible. There are a lot of good things happening in the literature showing this sort of simplification of the Bible. Uh, some of them get to move away from the Trinity. For instance, Wenham says, Traditional Christian orthodoxy is that Jesus is the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity. Whether he saw himself as Son of God in any sense, let alone in a Trinitarian sense, is highly debatable. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Whether Jesus imagined he was God the Son is very debatable. Well, I'm glad he's saying that. Poor old Jesus just didn't know he was God the Son. That's amazing. Note how the scholar gives with one hand often and takes away with the other. Whether he saw himself as Son of God in any sense, well, if he didn't, the rock foundation of the church on him as Messiah, Son of God, is shattered. He clearly saw himself as the Son of God, didn't he? Otherwise, what's that confession doing? But he certainly didn't see himself as God the Son. Over the page, professing the Jesus who is equivalent to the actual Jesus of history. I want to just finish then with a couple of remarks about Professor Luce, because this is my point on how much support there is for the Church of God stand here. Professor Luce, writing his History of Dogma in 1895, still not translated into English, spells out in detail the fateful move from Jesus as Messiah to Jesus as God the Son. This is in, in, a little bit in line with what Lee was saying in terms of Greek philosophy. It was the philosophically minded apologists, these are people who didn't say sorry for the faith, but they gave the faith, they tried to persuade others. People like Aristides, Justin Martyr, Tatian, Theophilus, who invented a prehistory for Jesus. They tacked on a pre-existence to his existence and made two existences, and thus two different Jesuses, cutting Jesus in half or doubling him. This is what Luke effectively said. The church is now saddled with this giant ecclesiastical blunder caused by forgetting the Hebrew Bible and redefining the faith in terms of Greek cosmology and philosophy. Luce has brilliantly described the downhill path from the apocalyptic kingdom 
Jesus, that sort of a Jesus, to a strange hybrid figure, supposed to be 100% God and 100% man. Would you believe it? The church theologians then argued for centuries about this invented Jesus. They tossed him around like some sort of a rag doll, using hair-splitting and fearfully complex terminology to define their Jesus. Have you read the Chalcedonian Creed? Unbelievable thing. And yet that's on the books of the churches of your friends. It's there if you ask the pastor. He doesn't preach on it a lot. But it's an amazing testimony to confusing and difficult language, it seems to me. Now, the Church of God is not alone in that next paragraph in complaining about that Trinitarian Jesus of the standard creeds. Hans Kung observed on his, in his book on being a Christian, neither Ignatius nor any of the later Christian writers wanted to give up Jewish monotheism. Phytheism and tritheism were always rejected in principle, but the more Jesus was placed on one level of being with the Father, and the more this was described in essential Greek philosophical categories, so many more difficulties were created in the way of reconciling conceptually monotheism and divine sonship. The distinction of the Son from God and the unity of God, all those problems, right? So I'll leave you to read the rest of that. They created a problem and then argued about it and eventually killed people who didn't agree with the solution. It's a kind of a sad story. Down the bottom of page eight, then, what are we going to do about this? First, I think, be immensely encouraged by the new books and websites appearing as support for the central truths of the Bible about Jesus and the Gospel. With Dr. Colin Brown, seasoned systematician at Fuller, no less, says this. To be called son of God in the Bible means you are not God. Isn't that great? That's what our dear friend Colin Brown, who's a Brit in his 70s, down Fuller Seminary, where James Dunn visited the other day, and some of our people here, uh, Lee and Dan, engaged in private conversation with James Dunn, who agrees with the Church of God, I'm happy to say, in Christology. This is rather interesting what's developing out here. So to be called son of God in the Bible means you're not God. What about this? To read John 1.1, 1, 1, says Colin, as if it said in the beginning was the son, is patently wrong. It's wrong. So this is coming from the Trinitarian camp, but really what he's describing is a Unitarian position. James Dunn, the most celebrated Christologist of our time, was personally interviewed by Dan Mages, Mark Adetta, Lee Greer. It's clear that he has given up belief in pre-existence, even in John. He's persuaded of our understanding that Jesus is what the Word became, not the pre-existing God, the Son of Orthodoxy. You see that? Jesus is what the Word became, not one-to-one -one equal to the pre-existing Son. That's an important distinction. If these leading men are coming to the conclusions equivalent to those of the Unitarians who struggled manfully against the odds to promote the real human Jesus, can we do any less? Could we not follow the example of Paul, who lobbied people for truth by going into the marketplace of his day? Would not the equivalent today be the internet? Several people have said that at this conference. Are you out there at least an hour a day, if you've got time, engaging the public on the internet? Why not? Is that our obligation? I don't know that that is fair, but it seems to me that it could be a real possibility. Why are we not personally engaging the public in the marketplace of today? Professor Bart Ehrman, finally here, gives us just the encouragement to action we need. What about this? Already by the end of the first century, Christians in some circles proclaimed that Jesus was himself God or divine, that he existed prior to his birth, that he created the world and all that is in it. This is a far cry, says Ehrman, from the humble beginnings of Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet. The concerns which drove the early debates about who Jesus is were far removed, says Bart Ehrman, from the concerns of Jesus himself. He wouldn't have cared about any of those debates, apparently. One of the strands of Christianity which has been consistently marginalized, says Ehrman, throughout the course of the past 1900 years, has been one which took the authentic words of Jesus seriously. That's an amazing statement. So if you dare say the words of Jesus are important, you're going to be pushed out to the side. That's pretty, pretty odd. The historical Jesus, Ehrman said, did not teach about his own divinity. Well, Ehrman is writing bestseller books. You know that. It's amazing. Now, he doesn't believe any of this, by the way. So watch out for the scholar who doesn't believe anything. But he's at least helpful to us. He says he's an agnostic. There's a great warning there. 
he finds what he calls discrepancies in the New Testament on tiny, tiny details. And on that basis, he says the whole thing is fraudulent. There's no resurrection. It's dangerous. So anyway, Bart Ehrman is helpful to us, though, in, in saying that G the original Jesus was not the, the Jesus that was eventually emerged. Paragraph in the middle, we can take as our basis the remarkable conclusion of Adolf Harnack, the prince of church historians, who says, Jesus is the beginning, the purpose, and the principle of the creation. But the Greeks, he says, wrongly, as a result of their cosmological interest, embraced this thought as a fundamental proposition. The complete Greek Christology is expressed as follows. In other words, the Greek cosmology was there was a big distant God here that you couldn't approach. And then there must be a lesser God or gods as buffers between heaven and earth. Well, what if the Son of God was that second God? Wouldn't that be nice? That would fit the Greek system well. So this is what they did. They read him back <coughs> into a pre-existent life and created a hybrid because you can't be pre-human and human. So here's the famous quote then from Second Clement, which isn't in your Bible. Harnack points this out. Here's a quote. Christ who saved us being first spirit and the beginning of all creation became flesh. That's Second Clement, probably written 110, 130 AD, nobody knows for sure, maybe later uh, given a false date, who knows. But that's the beginning of the rock. Jesus is first spirit and then flesh. What did Paul say? The first one was flesh, right? The second one is spirit. They turned it backwards and looked backwards instead of forwards. And the whole thing is now 30,000 denominations unable to decide on what the Bible says. That, I think, is the root of the problem, which the Abrahamic people put their finger on. At the bottom, I think the gift of the Abrahamic understanding about God, Jesus, and the gospel of the kingdom needs to be thoroughly instilled in all of our church members so that each can become an army of one, as well as a part of a team, equipped to talk to others about what they've learned. This will entail teaching about how we differ from the system, how this arose, how important it is, how men such as Servetus gave his life literally for these truths. And you've got a good footnote there to the famous book, Out of the Flames, a very tragic story of Michael Servetus, burned for the very doctrines that, that the Abrahamic people have stood for. It's all too easy for church to become a routine, in which the church is comforted week by week, but never really becomes a power for changing the world, leavening society, one person at a time. We cite the passage in Ephesians about the work of pastor teachers being to equip the saints for the work of ministry, but does this really happen? If Paul exhorted the Corinthians to be, quote, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that's a great text, if he was encouraged when in prison that his church members had become courageous proponents of the faith, so they didn't expect Paul to do all the work, he expected them to do evangelizing, is not, the, is not that the ideal which Paul hoped for the church also? And finally, three remarkable equivalences seem to point to one urgent task and a costly one. In Mark 10, 29, 30, Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, there's no one who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not get a hundred times as much now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land even, though with great troubles, and in the age to come, the life of the age to come, I would say, aeonian life, the life of resurrection. Now notice how Matthew reported that same saying, equivalent. Everyone who has given up houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or property, for my sake, you see the equivalency? For my sake is the same as for the sake of the gospel. Interesting. He will receive a hundred times as much in return and will have eternal life. Now Luke thinks of commitment to the kingdom of God, which is the same idea in different words. He said to them, truly I tell you, there's no man who has given up house or wife or brothers or father or mother or children because of the kingdom of God equivalent, right? My sake is for the kingdom of God's sake is for the sake of the gospel. Very clear. Those three things define each other. So to give all to Jesus is to give our finest effort towards his gospel of the kingdom of God, it would seem. And I thank you for listening patiently all that time. Take the rest home and we'll find again. Yeah, I don't know if we need to spend 
longer, but if you have some comments, corrections, um, additions, whatever, by all means, it's fine. Okay. Done. When you said, ready. When you said uh, so James Dunn has switched over. Yes. That woke me right up. Sorry? That woke me right up. Good. James Dunn argued with my cousin J. T. Robinson in the 80s about pre-existence. James Dunn in his first edition of Christology in the Making says, in Paul there's nothing about the pre-existence of Jesus, literally, but in John there is. My cousin J. T., who wasn't very good in eschatology, said, no, if you read John carefully, he also doesn't believe in the pre-existence of Jesus, literally. In the second edition of Christology in the Making, which is a must read for all of you guys, Christology in the Making by James Dunn, James Dunn eventually says, if you read John carefully, there's nothing about a literally pre-existing son. Jesus is human, one of the virgin. Has he, has he written this? So in, he has writ written In the introduction to his second edition. Okay, but has he spelled it out of his change? That's always... A powerful statement if you think, can get I think in the introduction, and, and Lee and Dan were there talking to him personally, and that was your impression, wasn't it? Uh, I, I used to say, or uh, I've changed my mind, or anything like that. Is that does that come out clearly? Write it down where you we can quote it. Okay. It's encouraging for us because here's a top scholar. He's the, he's the top of the line in Christology across the world. It's not a difficult read if you can get a hold of, of the second edition of Christology in the Making. It's, it's strengthening. It's, are we not to be at the level of experts, all of us, in some way? I think we can do, we can do better work in those, in those areas. I may be entirely wrong, by the way. You don't believe a word any preacher says. You check it all out. So these are only my own reflections. They have no ex cathedra authority at all. So Lee can disagree with every single word. He doesn't, but he could if he, he wishes, and we'd still be good friends. <laughs> In fact, he's actually a very strong Sicilian. Go to his website, I'll repeat it again, jesusinstituteforum.org. And there you'll find Lee, who comes from a Seventh-day Adventist background, agreeing entirely, really, with the Abrahamic position. And his father, Lee Greer Sr., is just over the moon. He's ecstatic. This is the worst thing I've ever hit the church. This trinity is, you know, sounds like another Greg Dibble, <laughs> almost, or another, another impassioned preacher. But, you know, this is a major thing. At the moment, there are, six, there are one billion Muslims who are antagonized by the Trinity. There are one billion Roman Catholics who are antagonized by our unity of God. You're talking with about three billion human beings who don't agree on who God is. So, is that important? It would seem to be important. We're not talking academic stuff here. We're talking about the very fabric of the universe, presumably. Defining God. That is the greatest commandment of all. Okay, any other comments? Uh, yes, I just bought a book by Bart Ehrman entitled um, Qu Misquoting Jesus. Yeah. And what little I've read of it, he seems to be implying that we can have no confidence whatsoever in the scriptures because of all of the scribal and copyist errors mm. over the centuries. Would uh, you comment on that, please? Uh, yeah. I think, I think that Bart Ehrman is a blessing in some ways to us, but he's also exceedingly dangerous because at the end of the day, he doesn't believe anything. 
nothing much at all. And I was shot along the same lines with Jim Tabor, similar to Bart Herman. Jim Tabor, I know I should mention these names, I have to edit these names out of the, of the DVD, that, that particular name. No, can't do it. <laughs> anyway, this man has translated the entire Bible. I knew him well. He's very, he's very clever. But on 2020, the other night, he was interviewed with his book about Jesus' dynasty. And when asked, does he believe in the resurrection? He does not. Does he believe in the virgin birth? No. So the answer to your point would be, it's nonsense to say that because there's a discrepancy over whether Abiathar or Himelech was the priest at a certain point in Mark 4 there, that means the resurrection didn't happen. That's just nonsense to me. If you can convince me that the whole story is wrong, I'd have to give it up. But I'm convinced after spending hours doing the New Testament, the great fun I had at the college, I still have, is going through these books sometimes twice in a day, the same book. You can't tell me that Luke is lying or was drunk when he wrote or was stupid or deliberately falsifying and that he reports that Peter said, and I believe this because I'm a trusting person, Peter said that we ate and drank with Jesus after he came back from death. I believe that. Until you can shake that, I mean, the New Testament is fine for me. The rest is detail.